All right, so this will be your neuro part three medications lecture. So first, we're going to start with chapter 11, so medications for other mental health issues. So we're going to start with CNS stimulants, such as methylphenidate and amphetamine, and the derivatives of these two. Uh, these are used to raise the levels of norepinephrine and dopamine in the central nervous system for the treatment of ADHD, conduct disorder, narcolepsy, and obesity. These, of course, then end up with CNS stimulation, um, which can lead to insomnia and restlessness. These also have a decreased appetite, weight loss, and growth suppression. Uh, some cardiovascular effects like dysrhythmias, chest pain, and high blood pressure can also occur, so watching them on their, their vital signs and their EKG. Um, psychotic manifestations, so they can start exhibiting hallucinations and paranoia. Um, and if this happens, this is definitely an indication to stop the medication. However, due to tolerance and withdrawal reactions, um, headache, nausea, vomiting, muscle weakness, and depression may be symptoms that we see um, and why we'll need to taper off gradually. So it may be a little sticky situation if they are having psychotic medications we want to come off. Um, but if they've been on it for a while um, and they may have some tolerance or um, may withdraw from it if we discontinue it abruptly. Um, and then we have toxicity. Um, this can be seen as dizziness, palpitations, high blood pressure, hallucinations, and seizures. The hallucinations we can treat with chlorpromazine and the seizures with diazepine, diazepam and then um, administering some fluids. We want to avoid concurrent use of these medications with MAOIs, caffeine, over-the-counter cold, and congestant medications as well, since these can stimulate the CNS more. NSRIs are also um, used for other reasons, so atomomaxine and bupropion. These can be used for the treatment of ADHD as well as depression. We've already talked about it briefly about depression, but um, just a reminder here about some of the major side effects. Um, it can also be used for ADHD. Trustically antidepressants, we've also talked about in Neuro Part 2, but these can also be used to treat autism, ADHD, um, panic and anxiety disorders, as well as OCD. So watching for that increased suicide risk, excuse me, um, some sedation, those anticholinergic effects, and watching for those signs of toxicity. And those that have seizures are not going to be, um, we should not be giving these to clients with seizures due to the increase, decreasing their seizure threshold. Um, and then again, it can take several weeks for full effects even six weeks for the completely full effects. Um, we're only going to give them one week of supply because it's easy to overdose on these medications and taking a bedtime might be a good education piece so that they don't have as much daytime sleepiness. Alpha-2 adrenergic agonists such as clonidine. These activate the presynaptic alpha-2 adrenergic receptors within the brain for the treatment of ADHD, tic disorders, and conduct or oppositional defiant disorders. Um, these have some CNS effects, but definitely have cardiovascular effects such as hypotension and bradycardia. We will actually use clonidine not as a treatment for these things, but a treatment for blood pressure because of its severe um, cardiovascular effect um, for hypotension. Um, so clients usually may have these, this medication as a PRN for their systolic above 160 or 180, especially uh, clients that are recently or are prone to having a stroke or in a hypertensive crisis um, because of this major potential side effect. Um, so be mindful of that. That hypotension can be quite severe in this case. Um, they can also gain weight, um, but we need to make sure that they're avoiding any other CNS depressants, alcohol, antihypertensives, and high fat foods. Excuse me, as this can um, 
increase the effects of these. Also not discontinuing abruptly, and this can result in rebound hypertension. Um, so they will be prescribed a tapering dosage prescription. Other medications such as atypical antipsychotics and SSRIs can also be used to treat these type of disorders as well. So be familiar with them. Um, I'm not going to repeat them in this area. Just be familiar with them from Neuro Part 2 lecture. And then we move on to medications for substance use disorders. So from Chapter 12. First, we have alcohol withdrawal. Um, so we want to make sure that we are aware of the symptoms um, in the four to six hours after withdrawal from alcohol. Um, so they can have the nausea, vomiting, tremors, um, increase in the heart rate, blood pressure, respiratory temperature. Make sure that we're monitoring the vital signs very, very closely. We'll have a, um, actually a spreadsheet that we'll have to um, in the hospital document and lay eyes on these clients every hour. Um, they can develop into tonic clonic seizures. Um, so watching for any tics or tremors that may develop and giving medication as appropriate. Usually the medications that we go to first are going to be um, benzodiazepines. Um, these are going to help with the seizure precautions, um, decrease that seizure threshold, um, and help with their anxiety during this time while their body is recovering. If they start to develop delirium, though, um, this can happen in, up to two to three days later, so even after that first initial treatment in the emergency room. If they develop delirium, this is a medical emergency and can lead to death. Um, they can develop high blood pressure and cardiac arrhythmias um, and leading to the death. So they need to be aware to come back in at this point. Um, this is a, a picture diagram that the last cohort had created um, for alcohol withdrawal. This has also been uploaded into the files in Canvas um, and hyperlinked into this week's page so that you can print off a full page of this for your reviewing. And then same here with the opioid withdrawal. They drew this from last year. Um, opioid withdrawal, um, we're going to use Narcan, of course, but that's going to be a sudden uh, elimination of all of that opioid in their system, so um, can be quite um, traumatic to their body. So we also have methadone as another treatment. Um, this is similar to morphine and used specifically to prevent withdrawal symptoms because we're going to taper this off. And then um, buprenorphine norphine, um, can also assist with pain relief during the withdrawal period, which we will also taper off. Um, and then clonidine. Clonidine, again, is that alpha-2 adrenergic, um, comes with that hypotension side effect, um, but it can help them with like vomiting and diarrhea in this case as well. So the difference in your withdrawal symptoms here are going to be for opioid withdrawal, you're going to see lacrimation, runny nose, diaphoresis, chills, muscle aches, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, like spasms and goosebumps. So that last kind of section um, are going to be similar, but your lacrimation, runny nose um, is quite um, unique to opioid withdrawal. Um, the rhinorrhea, sweating, um, pyelo erection, uh, restlessness, irritability, um, and flu-like symptoms. Um, so this can be often, if unknown, that they are on opioids, look like their child or whoever is, um, you know, having the flu, um, when indeed they are actually withdrawing from opioids at home. The length of withdrawal usually depends on the type of opioid that they were using. Um, it can be depending on the short acting versus long acting. And unassisted withdrawal from opioids is rarely fatal, but it can be very painful. Um, it's usually symptomatic and very supportive treatment, whereas like alcohol withdrawal can easily become fatal. Nicotine withdrawal, 
um, we can use a um, multitude of different methods because we don't want them to go into nicotine withdrawal while they're in the hospital because can't allow them to smoke. So usually this is the most common one that you'll see being treated in the hospital to prevent withdrawal. Um, so we have the nicotine patch, nicotine gum. Uh, make sure that with a patch that we are removing that prior to going to MRI um, and make sure that it's on a clean, dry area of the skin and that you're rotating sites. If you place a new one, make sure that we remove the old one. And then we have um, varenicline and bupropion. Um, these can uh, decrease the craving and manifestations of withdrawal. Um, but again, with your bupropion, make sure that you're not using it in clients that have seizures. Um, and avoiding caffeine and other stimulants, which they may want to resort to, drinking a lot of caffeine in the hospital because they're not getting their nicotine. But if we're already treating them um, with their bupropion or they're already on it for another reason, make sure that we're educating them about that caffeine. It can be quite um, not a good reaction for them. Um, and they can, you know, use other supportive measures for their dry mouth. Um, there's also like electronic e-cigarettes, um, but they're uh, still not a FDA approved. Um, they also have other chemicals and things like that. You got to think about what they're actually inhaling um, because we still don't know. Um, and but with, uh, oh yeah, so for Varenicline, make sure that we're watching that blood pressure though. Um, and they can also relapse uh, due to this as well, um, due to this medication and diabetics need to watch their, their glucose. So bupropion, if they don't have the history of seizures is usually the best, easiest one to go for. But if they do have seizures, then um, hopefully they don't have diabetes or we're gonna have to be monitoring that blood sugar on Renaclean. And again, those um, pictures are hyperlinked in the week and in the files for you to print out and view on a large, bigger portion for you to write on and things like that. Um, but these came from chapters 11 and 12 from your textbook. Thank you.